Hello and welcome to another video in this series as we go on a journey from the very simplest primes to the foothills of the Riemann hypothesis which is one of the most important open questions in mathematics. Now up to this point we've explored some fairly simple properties of the primes we just you know became familiar with them and explored some simple questions. Um, so today we're almost ready to explore a very important, very famous uh, theorem um, in number theory uh, and about the primes. Um, and it's simply called the prime number theorem. It's actually not very difficult, but there is sometimes um, a little bit of confusion about what it actually says. Um, so we'll try and focus on that today. Um, so let's dive in. So in the last video, we decided to take an experimental approach to the primes, um, which is um, a good thing to do when you're trying to find hints and pointers or kind of, you know, insights into a problem. Um, remembering that experimental evidence isn't proof, but what it can do is um, suggest strongly that you look in a certain direction. And what we saw was that the number of primes up to a given number um, seemed to be following a fairly smooth pattern, surprisingly smooth, given our intuition that the primes are fairly randomly located. Um, and what we saw was this expression here, n over log n. We saw that that was actually quite a good approximation for the number of primes up to n, this prime counting function. Um, but it wasn't exactly right, but it was approximately right. In fact, what we saw was that although the error gets larger as n gets larger, the proportional error gets smaller. That was an interesting distinction we made. Um, let's kind of say that in more detail. We saw that the proportional error gets smaller as n gets larger. So let's write that down. The difference between the true prime counting function, you know, the actual number of primes up to n, the difference as in minus this approximation, divided by the true value, in the limit is zero, or goes towards zero as n goes to infinity, it gets larger. Now we can rearrange this with just some simple maths. We can just divide the top and bottom um, by um, pi of n. And we can arrive at this much neater expression. So this is saying the same thing, and it's saying that the ratio of the prime counting function and our approximation goes to one as n goes to infinity. And that's, you know, we've said a lot of words there, but it's, it's kind of intuitively obvious. If they are the same in some sense, the ratio is one. And what we're saying specifically here is the ratio is one, quotes, they are the same, as n goes to infinity. Um, and actually that is what this very famous, you know, often quoted prime number theorem says. It simply says that this um, approximation and the true prime counts, they are increasingly the same, the ratio becomes one for larger and larger n. We'll come back to that definition um, again, um, just because it needs a little bit more um, refinement, but that's, that's a very, very solid start to understanding what it is. Now, you'll often see it expressed with this funny symbol saying, the prime counting function and this approximation are not equal, but have this squiggle. Um, and that's, that, that squiggle is called asymptotic equivalence, which is what we've just said, that the ratio becomes one as n gets larger. Um, actually, I should say, it is confusing that there were simple pi is used. Um, it's, you know, in this context, it's not the number 3.14159, um, but, um, that's, that sometimes catches us out 
is the prime counting function. So this asymptotic equivalence, um, let's look at it just a little bit more deeply. So we've already said that if there are two functions, f and g, they are asymptotically equivalent if the ratio goes to 1, as is 1 as n tends to infinity. So they might not be, the ratio might not be 1 for small n, but the ratio becomes 1 as n gets larger. So as n gets larger and larger, they become more and more equal. That's actually quite intuitive. We're just using a lot of words there. It's a trap you can fall into in mathematics. You can sometimes choose too many words uh, to try and be kind of unambiguous and um, and precise, which is a good thing um, at the at the cost of um, accessibility. So we have to be a little bit careful not to do that. Um, and that's probably a good reminder to say that um, this series of videos isn't a textbook. It's not about um, you know exact proofs and you know, everything to the nth degree of detail. It's about providing um, an intuitive overview um, so that, you know, as we learn about this subject, we can get a good intuition and then we can later refer to the textbooks which have all the detail. Let's look at a couple of examples um, of asymptotic equivalence just to get a feel for it. As I say, it's, it's actually not a hard concept at all, but um, sometimes the textbooks um, kind of throw a lot of <laughs> uh, content at you and it can feel like it's something more than it is. So let's take two really simple functions. fx is x squared plus x, nice and easy, and gx is just x squared, super simple. And we can say that the two are asymptotically equivalent and to show that we just have to show that the ratio between f and g goes to 1 as x goes to infinity. So what we can do here is divide top and bottom by x squared. In fact, let's do it over here as a simple example. So we said, so f over g in the limit x goes to infinity equals x squared plus x over x. And that's also where the limit goes to infinity. Bump. So divide top and bottom by x squared. and x squared, and we end up with 1 plus 1 over x over 1, which we can remove. So that's easy to see there. x goes to infinity, this thing gets smaller, so that's 1. Great! So that was nice and easy. Now, it's often uh, a useful thing to just look at the two functions, and you'll see that they both have the same kind of dominant term. Uh, x squared and x squared. So if this was 2x or 5x or 2x minus 3, we'd still end up with the same um, answer. It's also worth um, pointing out that um, f and g, if we swap them, that doesn't break asymptotic equivalence. Um, you know, that's maybe obvious or it may not. And the way to think about it, if it isn't, is that because asymptotic equivalence is defined as a ratio, if we invert the ratio, um, the ratio will still tend to 1 if, if, um, if there is asymptotic equivalence. Let's look at another example. Now this time we have two functions which aren't asymptotically equivalent. So if we say fx is x cubed, and gx is x squared, just by inspection, the, the two dominant terms are not the same. There's an order of magnitude difference, but let's, let's kind of work it through properly. So the ratio is x cubed over x squared, and we could have done it the other way around. We could have said x squared over x cubed. In this case, that's x, and as x gets larger, this doesn't tend to 1, so they're not asymptotically equivalent you can see that they would diverge um, by an order of magnitude as x gets larger. Great. The other in useful property of asymptotic equivalence, which is again familiar, is that if f and g are 
asymptotic equivalent and g and h are then we can also say that f and h are so this is a bit like saying with normal equivalence if a equals b and b equals c then a equals c and it's called transitivity um, and it may sound obvious it may be obvious or it may not and for those who for whom it isn't obvious it's worth sort of saying it here um, now in more advanced mathematics you know beyond school um, there are different kinds of equivalence relations beyond just the normal equal sign and uh, this is one we're looking at this is asymptotic equivalence and when mathematicians think about them and explore them um, they don't assume they all behave like an equal sign they have to kind of establish well which properties do stand and which ones don't um, and sometimes you know with other kinds of equivalence relation you know a equals b might not mean b equals a um, can't think of examples right now but they are out there um, in others this transitivity doesn't hold um, but here it does which is nice because it's familiar and it's how we expect equivalence to work and we'll make use of it as well now some of you might be thinking well hang on a sec um, in the last video we looked at two different approximations to the prime counting function we had the n over log n but then we also looked at the more accurate logarithmic integral um, so which one is it then? Which one does the prime number theory talk about? And if you kind of explore the internet or look at the textbooks, you'll, you might find sometimes the prime number theorem is written in terms of the logarithmic integral and not the simpler n over log n. So what's going on? Um, do people have two versions of the PNT, the prime number theorem? Um, are they actually the same? Well, the only way it's going to work if they both if they are not wrong, if they are both not wrong, is if the logarithmic integral and the other approximation, the two approximations, if they are both asymptotically equivalent to the prime counting function, that's the only way it's going to work. And for that to work, the two approximations have to be asymptotically equivalent to each other. Let's draw a picture of that because that's a lot of words. So we have some books saying the prime counting function is asymptotically equivalent to n over log n. And some books will say it's asymptotically equivalent to the logarithmic integral of n. Now the they, they can only, this whole thing can only be um, true, um, consistent, if in fact both are asymptotically equivalent and they are asymptotically equivalent to each other because of transitivity, what we've just talked about. So let's show that. Let's show that the two approximations are asymptotically equivalent to each other. That would put our minds at ease. So let's write that out. We'll write the first one, fn, which is n over log n, the simpler um, approximation. And then the other one, gn, we'll, we'll write that out fully as the logarithmic integral. And we need to confirm that the ratio of these two is 1 in the limit that n goes to infinity. Now looking at these two, um, they're a little bit troublesome to work with. Um, they both actually become infinitely large as n goes to infinity, which doesn't mean we can't work out the ratio and the limit. It just means it's it's not um, immediately straightforward. It doesn't just pop out. But that's okay. Um, you know, very often um, we can use techniques like L'Hopital's rule, um, which you might have done at school when you're doing calculus to work out limits. And L'Hopital's rule simply says that if the limit does exist, if, the big if, um, of, of f over g, it's the same as the derivative of f over the derivative of g. So it's the first derivative of both. The first derivative of f 
is fairly easy to calculate. It's um, it's just using the chain rule. It's not not hard at all. The derivative of the logarithmic integral is just one over log n because the integral of this is the logarithmic integral. <laughs> so it kind of pops out of its definition. And then when we write out the ratio, one divided by the other, we can do some cancelling and we end up with a fairly simple expression there. I won't go through the algebra because it's really trivial. Um, but it's just cancelling and so on. And it, we can show that, yes, the limit does go to 1. So what we've shown is that the two different approximations are asymptotically equivalent, which is good. If they weren't, <laughs> we'd have some deep questions to ask about the prime number theorem um, and in the last sort of, you know, many years of mathematics. Great. So just to kind of you know, underline what we've said, the two approximations are asymptotically equivalent. So the prime number theorem can equivalently refer to both because they are all asymptotically equivalent to each other. So that's fine. Phew, no need for panic. <laughs> now let's revisit this question about what the prime number theorem really says. So, it, you know, if when you're reading the books and, and you know, looking around on the internet, you'll often see the prime number theorem referring to one of those approximations, um, which is fine. But what it really is saying, it's saying that the prime counts, the prime counting function, grows in a way that is asymptotically equivalent to functions like n over log n and the logarithmic integral. That's, I've chosen my words very carefully there. It's not saying that log over n over log n is the only function that um, best approximates the prime count or the other one, logarithmic integral. It's simply saying that the prime counts grow in a way that is asymptotically equivalent to functions like those. So that could mean that there are other functions that the prime counting function grows like. It's not excluding that. It's not even saying that these are the best functions or the best approximations. It doesn't say that. So the prime count, the prime number theorem is more about the nature of the growth in an asymptotic fashion. It doesn't say that those functions are the best or it doesn't give them their, any particular importance. It simply says that the prime counts grow like them. And when I say like, we mean in an asymptotic way. So that's important, I think, to understand. Um, it's often kind of skipped over or kind of glossed over or, or not even said. So this, this, this is intriguing because, you know, it prompts the question, are there other functions that are better? What other kinds of functions are there that um, are asymptotically equivalent to the prime counts? Now, before we kind of finish there, I just wanted to sort of um, give an example of how the prime number theorem is actually quite useful, even if it sounds imprecise. You know, it's not saying that a function is the best or it's not even elevating one function to any particular importance. Um, so if it's so wishy-washy, is it important? Is it useful? Um, it is incredibly useful, but I've picked a simple example to illustrate it. So in 1845, Bertrand, um, Bertrand um, proposed a theorem, an idea, um, called Bertrand's postulate now, that there is one prime, at least one prime, between n and 2n, between a number and its double. Now this is different from what we looked at before, that was Legendre's conjecture, that was in a previous video. This one is proven, um, and the proof isn't amazingly difficult, but it does take a few pages. Um, but what the prime number theorem can do is give us an insight into how true it is with very little work. So let's do that, we've seen, we can, what we can do is use a prime number theorem to say, to compare the number of primes 
up to 2x with the number of primes up to x. And if we take the ratio, this 2x over log 2x is the prime number theorem for the prime counting function of 2x. Let's actually write that out. Um, might be easier to see. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare the number of primes up to 2x with the number of primes up to x. And the prime number theorem says that this thing, the top one, is equivalent to, remember n over log n? So 2x over log 2x. And we're going to divide by this one, which is a simpler um, x over log x, but because we're dividing, we invert it. So we can say x ln x. And this thing is, it can cancel the x's, ln 2x is the same as, let me just write that out, 2 ln x. ln 2x is ln 2 plus ln x. Now if I divide top and bottom by ln x, I get ln x. And let me just write that out. So that's 2 over ln 2 over ln x plus 1. And we can see straight away that x, as x goes to infinity, this goes to 0, ln2 over ln x, and that goes to 2. So what it's saying is that the ratio of the number of primes up to 2x and up to x is 2, but only asymptotically as x goes to infinity. So it's not quite true for small x, but it's increasingly true for larger and larger x. So there is a difference between saying that and what Bertrand actually said in his idea, but we can see that you know, if the prime number theorem is true, which it is, um, and we'll come back to that much later because it's quite a deeply involved thing to prove. But assuming the prime number theorem is true, then we can get this very easy insight without a lot of work at all. We've said that for larger and larger numbers, the number of primes between, say, n and 2n or x and 2x, the ratio is 2. So that's saying that between n and 2n there are approximately n over ln primes. Now that's actually, interestingly, slight side tangent here, there's actually a stronger statement than Bertrand's postulate which says that there's just one, or at least one. This is saying there's actually a lot more. So it's a slightly stronger um, statement, but it's only true asymptotically. So I just wanted to illustrate there that the prime number theorem, although it sounds imprecise, um, is quite powerful in giving us insights um, about the primes as as numbers get larger and that can be quite quite useful. So I'll stop there. Um, the prime number theorem isn't complicated but it's sometimes um, misrepresented a little bit and I just wanted to really kind of um, focus a little bit on setting that record straight. As I say, if there's any questions or if you disagree with anything or if I've made a mistake, which is entirely possible, do say so in the comments and um, we'll kind of explore that and either fix the video or um, kind of add a correction uh, or to re-upload a new one. Um, we're all learning together. Fantastic. Um, next time, um, we're going to look at another groundbreaking <laughs> uh, advance in, in, in number theory, uh, which I've been waiting to do for a while. Um, so we're looking forward to that. See you next time. Bye.